you know, poorness, sadly, is a condition of the spirit, is not a financial condition. Being poor is a condition of you saying, it's okay to be broke, I'm just gonna settle this, I'm gonna pass on to my kids generationally. Mm. That's actually the sin. There's always gonna be some form of product, mm. hype, right. a philosophy. It's right. always gonna grab people's attention. The shiny object is always gonna be out there. But what I've recognized throughout my 22 years in business, as long as it's based on values and principles, it will last for the long term. And by the way, people say, well, I'm not good at sales. Yes, you are. What do you mean? You just sold yourself on a living new belief and you bought it. Yeah. In this episode, you'll peep a conversation to have with the Medicare minister at a Spitting Fire podcast. Uh, by the way, isn't this a killer home here? It's a $25 million home here. We're doing a retreat with my guys at this uh, $25 million estate with uh, Patrick, Bet David, but that's for another episode. But here, people at this conversation I had with the Medicare minister on faith, on finance, and entrepreneurship and success in 2022 from a faith-based perspective. Let's check this out. What is up, friends? Rob here, the Medicare minister, and I'm back with a brand new Spitting Fire a podcast for all of you today. And I'm so excited to have Seven Figure Squad, Money Smart Guy, Mr. Matt Sapala with us today. Matt, will you say what's up to everybody? What's up, Rob? Great to be here with the Medicare Minister. What a cool name. Yeah, well, I'm so excited that you're here, and I know you're going to spit some serious, serious fire today. But listen, before we dive in today, I want to encourage all of you to like, comment, subscribe below, turn on the, the notifications. That way you're notified every time we drop fresh content like this, because we truly believe there's a leader inside every single one of you. And I pray what is shared today will put fresh wind in your sails to push you one more day to go after your dreams and the goals and vision that I believe God has for your life. So Matt, once again, man, thank you so much for coming on. I've been following your content now since the beginning of the year. And as I said off camera, I have been truly encouraged. And uh, would you just give us a little intro? I know I know your stories. I've watched enough of your videos, but I always tell guests when they come on, can you give us that highlight version, maybe a little bit of the past, the transition time into what you're doing today? Sure. Our family immigrated here from the Philippines. I'm a first generation born Filipino, born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, uh, uh, raised in a uh, middle to lower class type neighborhood, recruited into the Marines at 17 years old. No aspirations after high school. So I spent from 17 to 25 years old, served the United States Marine Corps, uh, three deployments, two combat tours. Uh, my last three years was an instructor. I was a door gunner in a helicopter called the CH-46 Frog. Uh, stationed out of Southern California in Orange County, Marine Corps Air Station, Tustin, El Toro. Uh, became a married and divorced father in the same year. <laughs> uh, I, I was became a single father, and uh, I was introduced. I wish I could say I was smart enough to get involved in the insurance industry, but I think the insurance industry sure. chose me. So uh, I've been in the insurance industry now uh, for 22 years, of which 14 mm. of that was a single father with custody of my three kids. I've been now married going on seven years, it'll be seven years in February. And uh, today I'm the chief distribution officer and number one income earner here at our national marketing, uh, national marketing agency, a financial marketing organization called PHP Agency. Sure, man, th thank you for sharing that. And one of the things that really attracted me to your content is obviously as a former church planner, pastor, someone who's done ministry, I tell people I've done every kind of pastor you can think of in a church, right? Even janitor pastor, if they had one. <laughs> and I was really attracted to the faith-based principles that you taught. And so one of the questions I want to ask right off the bat is, what is the biggest impact that the Bible has had in you both professionally and, and personally? Can you share a little bit of that? What led you to teach faith-based principles? Yeah, I, I came to the church really as a broken dude. I was making money. I started my career already in the insurance industry. By the time I was 30, I was already making multiple six figures, uh, about to make my first million dollars of, of cash flow. You know, from a kid who was raised with no large aspirations, making $20,000 a year as a sergeant in the Marines, to start making six figures, you know, it's kind of a big deal in sure, one's life. Sure. And so, But at the same time, too, you know, going through all that, I was still completely broken and uh, empty and spirit mm -hmm. inside. I uh, found enjoyment in just going out and having external sources, going sure. to the clubs, partying, drinking the whole, the whole bit. Uh, that was my life. Um, and my father said, what, what are you still going out for? I said, uh, uh, you're, you're a dad, you need to be home. And mm -hmm. like, yeah, what, whatever, dad, I wanna listen to you. But sure. it wasn't until I woke up at six o'clock in the morning one time on, on, a, on a Sunday morning, 
driving on the opposite side of the road. Mm, wow. <laughs> and a car was headed right towards me. All I saw was big eyeballs through that windshield. I veered left, almost hit the bus stop on the opposite side of the road, veered all the way to the right, and I put it my car in park. I said, what are you doing with your life? You, know, you, you could have mm. taken yourself out. Worse, you could have taken somebody else out. You know, worse, you could have been uh, orphaning your kids. And so mm -hmm. I, I decided that right then and there, I needed to change my life. And the Bible has made a major impact on my life. And, and I, I wish I could say uh, from a, a ministerial, pastoral standpoint, no, it's been affecting me economically. From a sure. financial standpoint, being a provider, uh, being a, a better father, being a better son, being a better leader in, an, in the business community. So I, I just felt that there was this whole conflict with me, with being a person who wants to follow God, wants to ch chase after God's heart like David was, but yet still be financially successful. Mm. And have financial. So I was wrestling with that. And next thing you know, I stumbled across Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And I'm like, what am I wrestling about? It's right here. Right. God wants us to be wealthy. God wants us to prosper. Uh, these Proverbs won't be in the Bible unless God wants us to follow these things. And I realized there's over 2,300 verses about money in the Bible, but 500 verses about prayer and faith. So it kind of tells yeah. you, people get faith and prayer, no problem. But it's the handling of money and stewardship of your talents and time, time and resources that a lot of people have a problem with in terms of giving back and honoring God. So in, in that journey, that's how... Bible and having faith-based principles kept me grounded without having to veer off on another side of the road if somebody's driving right at me hurting somebody else. Well, one of the things I like to say is that a lot of times we never find fulfillment because we tend to settle for lesser loves when God is saying, I have the real thing. Oh, um, you know, and it. it sounds like that's what happened to you. You had that Paul in Damascus moment, right? That, <laughs> that radical. I tell people I had an encounter with the cross 20 something years ago on the cross yeah. one right? Yeah. And it sounds like that's what happened to you. And sure. I'll fast forward because I don't, I don't necessarily script the podcast, but I did have something that I wanted to mention and sure. you, you touched on it a little bit, but it's this idea of contentment yeah. versus abundance. And I've heard you talk about contentment. So if we can, let's fast forward to that real quickly. Why do you think so many Christians, and I know I've been there as a former pastor, church planner, I thought uh, I had to be broke. Yeah. And I was behind on my mortgage and I had bills piling up and I was doing it all in the name of God because I was, yeah. I had this six figure skill set, seven figure skill set, but it was almost like I was too embarrassed or too scared yeah. to operate in it. Why do you think so many Christians struggle with that? I think with the original context of which it was written, which is obviously, you know, but the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and, and in Greek. And so if, if we translate, and you know this as a, as a person of Latino descent, as a person of Filipino descent, English yeah. being our second language, if the Bible was, had original text and English is its second language, sure. right? Things are sure. lost in translation. Yep. Now, I always wrestle with that word content because people say, yeah, you're making six figures. Why don't you just chill? I mean, why don't you stop being so damn ambitious? You know, <laughs> right. like, you know just relax you know, and contentment. And I've always had a challenge with retirement because that's my industry, retirement planning. Sure. Yeah. But I've actually said financial independence planning because according to any reference in the Bible, there's no such evidence that one should ever retire. The, mm -hmm. the only evidence was it in Leviticus where uh, the Levites at 50 some years old would have to retire from their position, but yet go back and teach and mentor and coach the younger pastors and priests coming up in the in the tribe of Levi. And so when, when you're looking at retirement planning, it's really a the world's way of saying, uh, uh, let us, the government, let us, some external source, take care of you because now you're dependent on Social Security and the interest rates of the markets versus saying, hey, man, I've prepared for myself. God has provided these uh, uh, the, these opportunities and, and I've saved the finances necessary to do it. Because if you look at the original word uh, of, of contentment, it's actually a Jewish word named Salak. Mm -hmm. And Salak, I'm probably pronouncing it the wrong way. All the Jewish people are probably uh, trolling me right now. Yeah. T-S-A-L-A-C-H, however it's properly pronounced in, in the Jewish tongue. But I'm just saying it for Salak, for lack of a better understanding of it, of how to pronounce it. But that word actually means moving forward. Mm -hmm. So it's not content to be chill and settle. It means to continually grow and move forward and to evolve and to, to contribute. And, uh, 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 you know, poorness, sadly, is a condition of the spirit, is not a financial condition. Being poor is a condition of you saying it's okay to be broke. I'm just going to settle this. I'm going to pass it on to my kids generationally. Mm -hmm. That's actually the sin. It's a, that's actually the sin because God wants you to be not only blessing yourself in, in, in taking care of your family and taking your house, your first ministry, your household, 
But also, once you take care of your home, you got to take care of your neighbor. Love your neighbor, love yourself, right? And then you, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that was my re- that has been my re- revelation when reading the Bible. No, I love some of the points that you've made in some of your videos because it's almost like, and I don't know if the church means to do this. You know, I, I want to be very careful because I have a faith-based audience that that <laughs> watches, but it almost seems like we're conditioned to settle for being broke. Yeah. Right? Or yeah. somehow we equate being broke with being more holy, right? And being sure. rich with unholy. And, and I think you would agree with that, that you've kind of seen that in the church space. And 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 the reality is, I agree. I, I My prayer is God bless me with more so I can be a bigger blessing to other people yeah. because we teach this thing called fulfillment. But I truly believe you won't find fulfillment until you're making an impact in the lives of other people. And yeah. what better way to do that? than having yeah. financial resources, right? Sure. And and, and my, my reading of the Bible too as well, I mean, Jesus was a baller. He was a rock star. Yeah. And uh, he wore the finest garments of the day. Matter of fact, why, why was the uh, Roman soldiers casting lots? Jesus was nothing to them. It's, it's not like, a, a, oh man, I got to get, you know, Michael Jordan to sign my jersey. Sure, I, want his, sure. I want his uniform. Well, why were right. they casting lots for mm. his robe? Because back then they sewed together the robe, the arms, right? And then the, the main body, and they sewed the arm and the garments together. But his robe was of one weave. So they don't want to destroy the robe. They said, oh, the, we can wash this thing. We can, you can press it out because this is a bombing robe that right. we can wear. So even Jesus had evidence of wearing some of the finest garments of that time. Yeah, I've heard it said this way, that sales and wealth are a good thing because it's a God thing. Sure. Right. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes we don't realize who created the well. Right. Who created these principles, these money principles that you're preaching on your channel and others. God did. And yeah. it would be a shame if we are not a good steward of those principles. And I think that's really what your heart is as you're you're teaching, uh, you know, these things on, on your channel. And, and listen, I believe you're you're a minister, man. You've been a minister to me and, and I wow. appreciate praise, that praise so God, much. Man. So I just feel like I need to keep encouraging in that to don't stop and the haters are going to be the haters. You, you yes. know that better than I do, right? Our favorite judgmental Christian community is definitely out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I get it all the time too. So it's, I, I totally understand. So let's talk about mentorship because you're very vocal about Patrick Bet David, who is the CEO of the company that yep. uh, you're with and, and mentorship. What do you think the biggest contribution uh, a mentor has in, in someone's life? What do you think is the biggest contribution they can make in someone's life as a mentor? I think a mentor will allow you to give number one's perspective. Mm. You can't see the picture when you are inside the frame. Uh, you, you are uh, only as good because you're reading your own headlines, right? I think a mentor will give you perspective of where you're going because, you know, when, when you're when you're you know, hard charging, you're you're driving forward. Sometimes you don't see the traffic lane. You know, sometimes you know you, uh, truck drivers have a much better perspective of what traffic is going on because they have the higher perspective in the road. Mm. So they can anticipate when the traffic is about to head. You're in a car behind something, you can't see that perspective. So I would say perspective would be number one. Uh, no- number two would be accountability. Mm. So if you if you say, hey man, I want you to mentor me, but you do nothing with the mentorship, then you don't have a mentor anymore. Preach. Yeah. They're, they're no longer around you because what good is their time and value sewed into you and you've done that, you've not done that with it. They're sowing you a seed, but you do nothing to cultivate and to, to grow and have it bear new fruit. So if you want a mentor, you have to say, hey, I want to be held accountable to your coaching and teaching because you have a responsibility to re- be received. Otherwise, you're just wasting each other time. And then there inher- inherently is the, is the sin. So uh, um, and the, th- the third one, so perspective, accountability. And I would also say transparency. You know, sometimes when you are when you are in a uh, conversation with other people, you, know, you, you tend to make things sound good because the data or the information mm-hmm. or the marketing right. behind it makes you look good in a very positive right. light. The mentor is going to say, yo, dog, I know what you say out there, but I know who you really are. So therefore, mm-hmm. what you are on stage or your platform, your YouTube channel, your social media profile, what you see on the outside should also be revealing what's on the inside. Because how many times have we seen these quote unquote influencers Making, yeah. you know, having a lot of influence, but not really having a business. And people are so enamored by these influencers and more power to them. I, I just hope that they have a business model that supports their influence on social media. And one of the, by the way, I, I applaud you too, Rob, because one of the hardest channels to grow is what you're doing right now, yeah. which are business and how to type channels. So uh, I yeah. applaud you and your endeavor and encouragement too, as well. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. So for the sake of not getting on a tangent, but I have to go there. 
Why do you think this generation, and I don't want to be one of those 47 year olds, that generation, you know, those young kids, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm there now. So I have to do that. But why do you think accountability is such a huge struggle for, for this generation? Because it seems like nobody really wants accountability yet. They want to be real. You know, what's that saying? Uh, uh, tough times create strong leaders. Strong mm -hmm. leaders create good times. Good mm -hmm. times create weak leaders. Weak leaders create tough times. Wow. That's good. You know, so we are, we've been having such a great time in America, you know, being in the military, I think a lot of people lose perspective, but the last 20 years we've been fighting a war. And so I think Rob, uh, what, here's a, here's a weird social experiment. I think sure. we should possibly sure. conduct one day because here's, here's what I recognize when you're in, if you're, if you're Jewish and you're in Israel, you have to serve the army for two years. Mm -hmm. If you're a Mormon, you have to serve your, your uh, what do you call it, their, their, uh, the mission right. for two years. Right. Right? Yep, that's right. right. Yep. And it's self-financed. You got, as a 15, 16, 17-year-old kid, you're saving money, so you, therefore you can go on this two-year mission. I wonder what it'd be like, not self-financed, I wonder what it'd be like if graduating high school, everybody had to serve some form of public capacity for a mm. couple years. Peace Corps, American Red Cross, the military, some form of nonprofit organization, you've got to serve for two years, and instead of giving people universal basic income, give it mm -hmm. some form of stipend where the government, will, hey, listen, if you do this, we're gonna financially incentivize you to do it, we might give you some tax breaks if you d decide to serve. Because I think when you see poverty in other countries, not America, I think if you see prisons in other countries, not America, it's country club here. When you, when you see, see people not pay their debts in other countries and people confiscate their kids, and, 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 and traffic the kids and put them under uh, 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 human trafficking and slavery because people uh, uh, cannot pay their debts, so therefore they give up their kids. I think you can get some perspective of how awesome the United States of America is and how good God is, has blessed this land and this country. And I think uh, uh, that is the, the era that we're in. We've been so insulated for such a very long time without any, give, any thought of giving any public service. It's been a we, me generation instead of yeah. a we generation. Because I think previous generations, all, a generation of say, oh, we worked hard, was, you're always gonna have that. But to filter that and drive that down further is, you know, during World War II, we had the, the World War I, World War II. You know, you had Korea, you had Vietnam, you know, you know all, all these different eras. And so you had so much of this influx of, of protection and, and, and not enough people out there actually serving and finding out what's really on. Because if they, if they find out what's going on on the outside of America, they'd appreciate what's going on the inside of America. Sure. Sure. And, and, and I think it comes down to something that you preach about a lot is learning what it's really like to live this life as a steward, right? Yeah. I think we have this entitlement and, and we consume and we consume and we consume. And Psalms 24, one says it this way, that everything's the Lord's, everything's God's. Yeah. And, I, and I love faith-based principles. Even if you take the spiritual side out of it, when you yeah. study faith-based principles, you begin to learn that you are nothing more than a steward. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I believe it breaks a lot of that entitlement spirit that, that floods this generation when you realize that you really don't own anything. You're just, it's on loan. You're, you're just managing yeah. it. And, and I hear you talk a lot about money and principles. And I've heard it said this way, that if you don't learn how to handle your money, your money will handle you. <laughs> and, and Right? And, and you teach a lot of that. What is the number one trait do you think financially in the financial literacy category that a leader needs to possess? Like what, what, is, what is a piece of wisdom you would get just right off the bat if they were getting started on this leadership journey wanting to own their own business? Yeah, it'd be clarity. What, mm. what is the God given yeah. dream God has given you? And are you clear yeah. about that? Right. And, and because if you're clear, if you have clarity uh, about what you feel God is inspired in you and God mm. won't give it to anybody else. So if you try to take that dream and get somebody else to try to believe in it, be like, yeah, please, you know, it's not going to happen. You know why it's, other people are supposed to understand it because God gave it to you. Right. That's between, that's yeah. between God and you. It's you, it is supposed to be twisted. Nobody else is supposed to understand it. It's your dream. Yeah. And so, and so when you are clear about that dream and then you start asking yourself the better questions, okay, Lord, what type of talents, resources, mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. opportunities, yeah. what doors need to be closed, what relations need to be cut. So therefore I can manifest the dream because I am clear about this dream you've given, this ministry that you've given me. And once you're clear about that and I ask yourself this question, okay, God, okay. Am I really willing to meet the demand of those dreams? Am I really willing to come mm, through? Am I good. really willing to meet the demand and make the time necessary 
no matter how long it takes. And he, the, the sad part about today is you see so many different stories. Oh, last year I made seven figures on Amazon. This year I made NFT. This year I made some Bitcoin. Blah, blah, blah. There's always going to be some form of product, mm. hype, right. a philosophy. It's right. always going to grab people's attention. The shiny object is always going to be out there. But what I've recognized throughout my 22 years in business, as long as it's based on values and principles, it will last for the long term. Mm. And if you, you can make a lot of money, you can make quick money right now, but then you got to find another thing. The problem is, let's say you, you put your money inside Bitcoin. Okay, you can make all this money in Bitcoin NFTs. You buy it low and then you sell it high. Then what? What's next? What's your next deal? You, yeah. you, already, you already made the yeah. trade. So yeah. you want to create a system and a business that actually brings that on a monthly basis. And then you diversify into those things. But the first thing is to create that initial Mississippi River of cash flow because one thing that we've uh, recognized, Rob, the, the, the crazy part that during this pandemic, we did the numbers yesterday, we gave it to our national team last night, but the coach, the people that we've coached and mentored throughout this pandemic since January last year to year to date right now, the recording of this, this podcast is, uh, is uh, what, December, what, 6th? Yep. Uh, we've paid our guys commissions. And this is not PHP. This is just the guys I mentor with inside the platform PHP, the guys that I personally uh, mentored, recruited, trained, and developed. We paid over $21 million of commissions wow. since this pandemic. Nobody's asked for a PPP loan. Nobody's asked for an uh, unemployment check. Nobody's asked for government assistance. Nobody's asked for Section 8. Our guys have been making money because they learned to take the skill called entrepreneurship, this God-given talent that they didn't know was there, and say, you know what? I can make my own bread. It doesn't matter what happens in a White House. The most important thing is what happens in my house. Mm, that's good. For man. me and my house, we're serving the Lord, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spin some fire. Where's the offering play? Let me put some money in the offering play. Where's the choir, right? No, thank you, Matt. Listen, what Matt is saying is, is your dream for sale? Right? It's one thing to dream it, but then it's another to really write it down oh, and get man. crystal clear about it and really count the cost. You yes. know, really, really count the cost. And that's really what you're saying, Matt. And so let me ask you this, because you teach a lot about faith based millionaires. Yeah. Is clarity the number one trait that they have to possess to get there? Or is it something added to clarity if they want to get to that faith based millionaire status? Yeah. And then next thing you need is skill and strategy. Mm. You need some skills and strategy. You know, uh, we just released a video today. One of the number one skill that you can acquire that will stick you out above and beyond everybody else is how to work that phone, how to make yeah. some calls. Yeah. Rob, you know, you, you, you and I are in the, in the, in the business sales, but sure. when, do, when do people get the most amount of impact reading a message, a tweet, uh, watching a, a video online or experiencing Rob Sevilla preach on preach, preach behind the pulpit. Right? Pulpit, yeah. Of course. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos even said, listen, when I started Amazon, nobody knew what yeah. the internet was. Yeah. And I still had to call 60 people. I still had to call 60 people. I'm pretty sure he had 120 people on the list, but it boiled down to 60 people that actually picked up the phone. Right. So please with these 60 people, 40 of them said no, 20 said yes. On average, they put in 50,000 dollars to Amazon. He gave them 20% of the company. Man, he created wealth for people. A lot of money for the people that got early in on, on Amazon. And so when, when I'm looking at skill, right? Phone skills, uh, sales, by sales skills. For those of you that's out there, the reason why you follow the word, you follow a politician, you follow an actor, you follow a restaurant, because somebody sold you on something. Mm, a presentation was solid. Right. Yeah. The market was there, and then they presented to you in a way that you bought. And by the way, people say, well, I'm not good at sales. Yes, you are. What do you mm. mean? You just sold yourself on a limiting belief, and you bought it. Yeah. You just That's sold yourself good. in a lesser life and you bought it. That's right? good. So you yeah. get it sales, right? And so uh, so uh, those skills, uh, in terms of strategy, find yourself an industry that's going to pay you well. Find yourself an industry that's not going to be affected by a pandemic, uh, uh, by, affected by supply chain. It's not going to be affected by people, uh, you know, uh, rioting and, 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 and uh, lo uh, loitering your uh, 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 looting not loitering, looting your, your business. You know, I've, I've, I've a good friend of mine, Billy Deck, Filipino guy, half Filipino, half German in, uh, in, in Chicago, owns a bunch of restaurants. They had a bunch of fa right. family memorabilia in his restaurant. When, when the, uh, the riots, you know, last year started during the pandemic, sadly, they, they broke into his restaurant and, and destroyed his family memorabilia. memorabilia. And so f find you a business where you can make money when either the doors are open or the doors are closed. When people deem you essential or deem you non-essential, you still 
make money. So that's that's strategy. So those are the things that you need to find yourself an industry, you find yourself a business that doesn't require a lot of moving parts. Um, and you'll make your first million in one thing and don't try to say, don't buy into this whole, well, multiple streams of income. Yes, right. but get your Mississippi River first. Come on. Plot, plot that one land. And then once you got that one land going, then you start cultivating the other land. And then you start, once you got that going, you start cultivating planting in the other land. Once you got that going, you plant and cultivate the other land. And then harvest, boom. Right? When, that, when you're done with harvesting in that land, you you sow and, and cultivate again, boom, harvest the next land. You see, but it, you have to have one that gets you going. You have one that makes you six figures. You have one that makes seven figures. And I say millionaire because not for the sake of just being a millionaire, Rob, but if you want to live the life that you think that God wants you to live, to not only take care of yourself, by the way, this is the Bush Bush family model. But we, we spent some time with a, a president, a former president George W. Bush. And this is the Bush family's model, the Kennedy's family model. You go out there, you go make your money. You take care of yourself, and then you take care of your wife, and then you take care of your kids. Once your initial family member's taken care of, then the rest of your life you devote it to public service. But you got to take care of you first. You got to take care of your home. Yeah, that's good. So, so that's the Bush family uh, a, a strategy. Yeah. So you go out there, you, you make your money, and don't diversify too fast into other things. Make your Mississippi River cash flow first and then divert into streams. Well, it's interesting you say that because one of the biggest paradigm shifts for me was when a friend of mine told me, you'll preach the best sermons when you're financially free. Of course, yeah. And it, it especially changed, coming from, it, yeah, it changed my whole life. It, it, you're right. And especially if you've been broke before. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going to hit that offering speech really hard at the end, you know, if you're broke. But if you're financially free, you're just going to lay it all on the line. So I, I love what you're saying. Uh, let me ask you this. And I know we just got a few more minutes here, but let me ask you this. What was the biggest breakthrough you had to ha have to make your first million? Can you, are you able to share that? Was there a defining moment, a paradigm shift that you remember? Uh, uh, a burning yeah. bush moment, if you will? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, my, my family, well, listen, listen I'm, I'm being transparent. My, my family unit was being attacked because mm. I started having some financial success mm. and the ex became envious. Mm. And, 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 and here's the thing about envy. We just discussed it with Rabbi Lappin earlier. The thing with, with envy is she wanted to destroy my future because she didn't want me to have it because she didn't want to do the work. Mm. Okay, That's so she good. wanted to go about and go, uh, and go get, it's like, uh, it's like somebody says, well, uh, what's that? Uh, Na remember back in the day, uh, Nancy uh, uh, carrying the ice skaters, yep. she went, right? She tried to go uh, break her leg with a pipe during right. the Olympics. Instead of going out there and competing and doing your very best, what she said, well, I, if I'm not going to win, I don't want you to win either. So, so when I realized that somebody was attacking me with the enemy of envy, I needed to double down. Mm -hmm. I realized that if I didn't double down because of, because of my sin, Rob, right? Because of my sin, because of my lack of understanding clarity of what sex meant outside of marriage. I didn't mm -hmm. understand that. I thought it was cool, blah, 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 your high school, da, 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 all these yeah. different, different things without realizing that there's actually a spiritual effect yeah. on that in your life. Yeah. And the template of how you live your life is actually through the template of how a marriage should be according to the Bible. Mm. And so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm coming late to the word, man. I'm coming like, like you know, the score is down negative 20 and I'm just coming to like, how come we're losing? <laughs> sure. No. Yeah. yeah I'm just I coming to show. So when I realized envy was attacking my family because of daddy's sin, I needed to double down and make sure I was financially in a, a, a capacity to rise above and get the financial mouthpiece and the legal mouthpieces that I need to make sure I protect my family. And so I, I would say, I wish I could give you some form of spiritual enlightenment, a burning bush moment. No, it was hey. my family's being attacked, brother. Oh man, that's, 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 I, I, I keep it 150. I go past 100 or 120. I get, to, that's 150 moment. And, and, and I just did a sermon that we're recording that we're going to be releasing called the miracle in the mess. And two things that we point out is what I believe happened in your life. Number one is God had to do a miracle first in you. Yeah. Right. And then the second thing is once he does a miracle in me, now he wants to do a miracle through me. And I believe right. that's what God is doing with seven figure squad. Would you agree? Uh, amen. Praise God. I mean, yeah. uh, yeah. we, we looked at uh, as an, in, you know, Rob, we're both in insurance business, but as an yeah. individual producer, my best year was seeing about 80, 90, 100 clients selling life insurance and index annuities, doing retirement planning, doing senior seminars, doing mailers. Yeah. You, know, you, know, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, dinner seminars. Yeah. Yeah. So at best, 
maybe 80, 90, maybe a hundred clients a year. Sure. But throughout this pandemic, throughout this pandemic, we've been able to assist because we understood scale. Mm. We understood duplication. Yeah. We understood that uh, building a team, building an organization, scaling out to many different areas of the country. Because I want to make money when the sun first hits the United States of America, when it hits the Central Coast, Mountain Time, Pacific, Alaska, Hawaii. I want to make money around the clock if we have an opportunity to do so. And so, make a long story short, 25,000 life insurance policies have been sold wow. in the last couple of years. And if we added the average life insurance death benefit to those policies, approximately $7 billion of life insurance right now is in force because we decided to make this decision to serve and help others. Wow. Well, I ask everybody that comes on the, the podcast this, if there was one word you could use to describe yourself, what would that one word be? One word, huh? Just one word that you could describe that Matt Sapala, what would that word be? Difference. Difference. I want to so make a difference. Part, so part B to that question would be how has being a difference maker contributed to your overall success? Because I chose to make a difference. Um, it's geared, my, my life now is geared towards serving and helping other people because I, I want to make a difference in other people's lives. Since, since a difference was made in my life, the whole pay it forward mantra, right? Since the difference was made in my life and when I'm recruiting and teaching, coaching other people when it comes to money, I see myself back in those broken moments. I see mm -hmm. a couple, I see a family, I see a single dad, I see a single mom, I see them in the broken moment, especially during this time of the year. And I know what that's like. And silently, Rob, I don't, I don't go and put, post this on social media, but silently, sure. I, I vastly overtip servers. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you put there in the check, you're signing off your check, yeah. you put a tip. Yep. It, yep. It, 10%. Sometimes I, I, don't, I don't even look at it. It's just lunch and I, it's, oh, psh, 100 bucks, $100 wow. tip. They don't even know it. And here, here's why I circle it and said, God loves you. Sure. Circle God loves you. They don't, they don't need yeah. to know, you know, what I do. They don't need to be a client of mine. I just said, man, God loves you. 100 bucks here, 100 bucks there. I just want to silently tip. So there's a lady that was going to our gym. And uh, I know she was coming in a walker. I said, dude, dude, she's young. She's walk, coming in a walker, you know, barely walking. And I asked the trainer, what happened to her? She said, man, she got into a bad car accident. She's learning how to walk all over again. Right. I said, Here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make sure her membership is now charged to my credit card. And mm. I want you to train her twice a week. I mean, she's coming, she three times, out of three times she comes in on her own. Well, two times I want you to personally train her. Wow. To show movements, all these different things. And here's the thing, here's, here's my only ask. You don't tell her it's from me. Mm. don't tell us for me, but I want you to tell her God loves you. So I want you to do God loves you. And I think Rob, in my own little way, I think I'm making a difference that way. No, I agree. One, one of a pastor that I listen to quite regularly, he says it this way, that the gospel came to us on its way to someone else. And, and I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that with yeah. that, that some of us, listen, if you're watching this today, you're being stingy with what God has given you freely. And the fulfillment that you're seeking is on the other side of you just beginning to practice out of this world generosity like Matt is talking about today. Well, Matt, as, as, as we wrap up here, um, where can we find you? I mean, I know where I can find you because I watch yeah. you pretty regularly, but give us some places where we can find you. What social media platforms? Yeah, very easily. Just look at Money Smart Guy anywhere on social media. MoneySmartGuy.com, Money Smart Guy on Facebook. The only difference is it's the official seven figure squad YouTube channel. <laughs> there you go. If you, were to, there you go. If you find money, smart guy, you, you I'm sure the, 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 the official seven figure squad will pop up because I mean, last year, uh, I, I even, where were we at last year, last December, what was the subscriber base last year? But before we did, we, we were barely at 20,000 last year and wow. we dedicate ourselves to a run. We went on a run brother uh, every day. Last December vlogmas is called vlogmas in the YouTube community wow. every day for, 24 straight days ending on Christmas. We decided to do a video every day. I thank this team for helping us get that done because it's, it's a process. It's a, it's a lot of commitment to doing a video every day for 24 straight days until Christmas. But that blew up our YouTube channel. We got we crossed you know 50,000 in January, crossed uh, what 100,000 in, in, in May, March, somewhere in there, uh, uh, second quarter of last year. And uh, we're eyeballing 150,000 subs. So please, if you, if you could, please subscribe to YouTube channel because once we get sure. to 150,000 subs, we're going to give $5,000 away to a church charity or a nonprofit on behalf of uh, subscribers of the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. So, yeah, Money Smart Guy and the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. Well, listen, man, I'm nowhere close to that, but I'm super humbled that you would come on today. And I pray that I can make the impact that you've made in other lives and in my life. I know you're a busy guy. And so I truly appreciate it. Listen, as we wrap up today. I just want to say this. I believe God has called all of you. There's a leader inside of all of you. Matt can't make you see it. 
I can't make you see it, but you got to see it for yourself. And I pray that something that we said today, as we said earlier, puts fresh wind in your sails and compels you, pushes you, motivates you, inspires you to not quit, to realize that your dream is not for sale. Once again, I want to just encourage you to like, comment, subscribe, share this with somebody that you believe needs to hear this because you never know their breakthrough may be on the other side of what Matt has shared today. God bless you guys. Make it an awesome day. And we'll talk to you guys soon.